Well, thank you. And I want to do a very quick introduction to Penny. I mean, most of you know all about Penny, otherwise you wouldn't be here. There's a lot of uh, people who are here to hear from you. Uh, in fact, there's about 50 or 50 people on So, you're a very popular broadcast. They're here for you, not me. Definitely here for you. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Penny Wong, uh, Senator Penny Wong, who is a Senator from South Australia. Has been since 2002, and she's currently the leader of the opposition in the Senate and our shadow foreign minister, uh, and hopefully our future foreign minister following the next federal election. And yes. Um, I think it's true to say that she is probably one of the most respected politicians um, in Australia. We were just talking to you before you arrived about why would you run for office and, and why people hate politicians, and I said, I did it because people can make a difference to people's lives, um, even though you can pay less and spend less time with your family. And Penny really epitomises um, a consummate um, political leader in this country. Uh, she's intelligent, she's passionate, she's steadfast, fiercely, fiercely uh, intelligent and passionate, I can say. And she probably doesn't know this, but I, um, we met 11 years ago, Somewhat of a public professional, so I'm um, talking about this. But she was, I think, she, a shadow minister at the time when I was living as one policy advisor on the road. And when I came to Canberra, even before I came to Canberra, I saw her as a role model. And the reason I saw her as a role model, uh, it sounds a bit strange, but she is someone from a migrant background who had to struggle through all the challenges and the obstacles that migrants had to, to enter into a world which, frankly, is pretty monocultural still is to a certain extent in Canberra. Um, and that gives me a great deal of admiration and respect for what she's done, what she's doing at the time, and what she's done since as a political leader in the country. To keep that respect, that high respect that she has across the country is, is no small feat. And it's because of her authenticity, because of her passion, her intelligence, and her commitment to those labor values that we all uh, ascribe to and want to be part of and implementing the government. So that's a, a bit of a confession about you and role model and Lee Penny, and I'm sure for many, many others uh, around the country, uh, whether they want to get into politics or want to make a commitment to public service, um, you, you really are an example to them uh, and, and really a guide to so many people. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Penny, she wants to say a few introductory remarks, um, and then we'll get into that Q&A. She doesn't know what I'm going to ask her. Don't go into pieces. I was saying I'm going to do a Tony Jones or Emma Alvarici, should I go for softer than that? No? I think you can handle this um, <laughs> So thank you. Welcome, Penny Wong. A round of applause for Penny. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you all for coming out from this lovely Melbourne evening to a very cool place. Well done, Melbourne Master. Thank you very much for, uh, for hosting us here today. Thanks, Peter, for the opportunity to be here. Can I first acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past and present? Can I acknowledge all the people I know in the audience, parents of former staff, former staff, colleagues, former colleagues? It's wonderful to see you all here. Um, uh, I was just thinking as uh, Peter was talking when he said very kindly uh, he thought of me as a role model because you know, we're both migrant, we're from a migrant background. And I was remembering this moment in the set of tactics room when we were discussing the bullying hands and motion, which got a little bit of coverage saying, you know, it's okay to be white. And I made a joke here, yeah, can be white, and I was suddenly looking around the room and I thought, well, I, mean, I actually am the only person who's not white in this room. <laughs> so we still got a bit of a way to go. When I first went to Canberra, I actually remember calling my mother. Sorry, you're all here because of foreign policy and I'm telling you anecdotes. I'm all here. Um, and I said, Mum, Mum, it's like, you know, the chick in the library. It's a Ben Chen, who was the Taiwanese um, senator of the Liberal Party for one term. And the leaders are me. That's it. <laughs> but I'm very pleased to say over the years I've been in Canberra, which now is, um, uh, you know, I've been there for a while. Um, things have got a lot more diverse, so that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> didn't stop with the whole party saying, yes, it's okay to be white. Um, 
I thought I'd do, make a few brief comments because Nita, as you know, is irrepressible and has, I'm sure, a very long series of questions for me. And then we'll just say this is Victoria and Melbourneians really like to ask politicians questions. So I'm not going to talk for too long. I, I did think of giving you a sort of 40 minute speech and then prevent anybody from asking questions, but I thought that would make me most unpopular. I'm just going to make uh, a few comments. The first is, uh, I was watching the debate uh, but at the last election when Tanya was Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, and Julie Bishop. And Julie Bishop, of course, in that debate said, we take the world as it is. We deal with the world as it is. And I remember thinking at that time, you know, that sentence needs to come in. Because what we, well, the Labor government uh, will do if we are elected, and what Labor has always done is we deal with the world as it is, but we seek to make change for the better. Uh, and that is the difference between, I think, our side of politics. Uh, I've spoken, uh, this is a, a very interesting time to be Labor spokesperson for foreign affairs because it is a time that, as I've described and others have described it, as a time of disruption, uh, where a lot of the certainties of decades past, a lot of uh, the traditional ways in which we thought the world would deal with conflict and competition uh, have really been confronted. But I range of factors, I think Brexit is one of them, the rise of nationalism, and the election of the increased assertiveness of China, we can go on. Uh, and certainly the economic landscape has changed as China and, and, and the Asian economies have become much more central and a much greater part of the global economy with constant strategic things. So things have changed. How do we deal with it? Now, that is really the question that confronts this government and will confront the next government of Australia. Uh, Bill's talking about speech today. I've come from Sydney from uh, his foreign policy speech. Uh, and he said a few things that are worth, I think, reminding us of. First is that an Australian uh, Labor government under, under him will have a foreign policy which is in, independent, confident and ambitious, uh, which I think is very important. Um, second, uh, that we will focus very clearly on Australia's national interests, which uh, include, obviously, the security relation to people, the prosperity relation to uh, stability in our region uh, that is based on the rule of law, that is a, a rules-based way of dealing with conflict, and finally what we call constructive internationalism, which is really my take on Gareth Evans for international citizenship, which fundamentally means Australia working with other countries to deal with things such as climate change, nuclear disarmament, uh, people movement, the, the whole range and the, and the whole range of challenges the global community faces that no one can. Uh, can do. Uh, Phil also spoke a lot about the Pacific and the importance of the Pacific uh, to Australia and the importance of taking the partnership approach, not a paternalistic approach, uh, recognising the blue Pacific continent uh, and the importance to Australia of uh, that region uh, and the importance of greater investment in infrastructure. I'm happy to talk about that later uh, as part of our aid program. But most importantly, what I wanted to say to you tonight, I look forward to is this. I see foreign policy not only is the assertion, as the assertion of values and interests, but it is, it is the assertion of our national identity. It is about who we are. Uh, and I don't need to say this in a city like Melbourne, I don't need to say this really in state like Victoria. Uh, but let us remember always uh, that our diversity, uh, our First Nations peoples, and the various waves of migrants, including uh, from our two families that have built this country, contribute to a diverse, confident, and multicultural nation. Uh, and that national identity is not only important for national cohesion, it is also an expression of our national power, because that identity projected into our region uh, is an important aspect uh, of national power and an important instrument for foreign policy. So we stand up for diversity for many reasons. Well, one because because it's right, because it is who we are, but also uh, to make sure our region knows who we are. The story I always remember <coughs> is many years ago when Pauline Hanson first, at the first iteration of Pauline Hanson, and I rang my dad who was living in had in Malaysia at that point, and he's a Colombo plant educated Scot architect, and he actually said to me. You want to come back because you've got this politician over there saying that we should ban Asian immigration. It is a reminder of how these values debates 
the bank's like, it's okay if you want, and then and, and, uh, the sounds in our region to sort of the edge. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you to all of you if you're interested in foreign policy and uh, to this wonderful state and city for your international contribution to the nation. Well, we're glad you didn't go back, first of all. Um, which, maybe before we get into the foreign policy, first question might be, what would you have done if you didn't go to the Senate? And what would you have wanted to do in your career if you weren't a senator and a group of Well, <clears throat> I actually uh, did Masters of Chemistry in year 12, because that's what good Chinese girls do. <laughs> <clears throat> Got into medicine, as I was going to work in the Sol Sol and uh, then I went to Brazil on exchange scholarship and I was like, I don't like blood, so this is not a good idea. <laughs> and I sort of stuffed around thinking about what I was going to do instead of it in a couple of years of arts. <laughs> then eventually got into law. So uh, that's what I was going to do, but you know, the medical degree was problematic. Well, nothing wrong with a good arts degree. People ask degrees what we need. Well, I actually did boring thing in the end and did law as well. Well, I did ask that. Um, so, what have you been most proud about, proud of, in your time in the Senate as a, a political leader, uh, an opposition or in government? I got asked this question the other day, and I, I know that it's quite, quite hard to answer because I don't think there's one thing. Um, I mean, I was proud to be part of the government that ratified the Kyoto Protocol. I was proud to do the work on the um, emissions trading scheme, even though it didn't. You know, we weren't able to get through under me because of um, what happened inside the coalition that we got substantively the same scheme through later. You know, if we we obviously lost the election and it was appealed, but it was very I was proud as a finance minister, you you had to be back there, my former chief of staff on the back there. Um, I think as finance minister you you're often be part of things without necessarily being the front person, but you know, it is a good thing to be to make the hard decisions that are necessary to do things like fund the national disability insurance and to fund the Gonski report and to fund the mental health package and a whole range of other things which matter. And those things don't just occur in the ether, they those they have you have to find in often difficult physical circumstances the resources to make those investments. Uh, and I was um, and I was proud you know, that the nation, made, the nation removed the discrimination against LGBTI people in Australia. I mean, I think that that marriage equality campaign was really an uplifting moment for the country. As I said on the day of the, of the vote, after I cried in front of people, it was quite difficult. It was rather difficult. Um, I said, you know, this is one of those days, there aren't many, but we really feel this just talking about Scott Morrison and things like that. Don't fall over. Um, See the women in the room. You touched on that, that motion by Colin Hanson, but even earlier than that, um, there was this speech by Fraser Anning in the Senate, which was effectively a, a sort of a, a fascist speech that had a hierarchy of, of what an Australian, Australian citizen should be. It had to be a particular race, an Anglo race, a particular faith. And in a sense, I, I mean, I did some media on this, and I know you did, but basically said to people that being Australian has nothing to do with your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation. It has everything to do with embracing democratic values, quality before the law, and that quintessential Australian value of the fair go. How, my question I guess is, are you, is there a deep disappointment that we're in 2018 and we're still getting a senator in the Australian Parliament making such a speech? Is that something that affects you? I can't remember if I said this in my speech, but I just remember it as well. So my parents, so mum was white, and dad, as I said, Malaysian Chinese, and Australian study. They married all the white Australian poverty. Um, and as you know, the ending of the White Australian policy actually was bipartisan, but also both parties of government contributed to its dismantling over a period of time. Um, and I thought to myself, I can't believe my parents married an 
and this policy was in place, and here I am at this age and this time, and we're still having an argument about why Australia was. Um, I'm turning to pick things. Look, which, 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 not the same. Um, the only way I can deal with the stress of that is to tell everybody, so now you're amongst the thousands of Australians I have told. Uh, but I did think, you know, I'm going to be 50 soon, I'm still having this conflict. Uh, so, but I mean, it's important, I think, to, there's, there's often, silver linings is a bit of a cliche, but sometimes those moments where you're confronted with prejudice or discrimination or, uh, you know, an impediment to progress, so like the marriage equality campaign, all this, where we actually finally had enough good people in the coalition to remember that it's part of their history. I mean, my, my speech I gave, I pointed out to that the, this country being able to be a successful multicultural nation, a country that has turned it, turned away, turned it, its back on prejudice and discrimination, we have much more to do, but at a fundamental political level and an idea of government level, our progress, the arc has been towards greater equality and to the removal of discrimination over time. It's their history too, and they need to remember that when, you know, notwithstanding the people in governments and the various stuff that you get here about gangs, etc. as well, it's that actually it was part of the liberal history as well, and they would do better to remember that. Um, just before I get up to foreign policy and international development, last question on this. Practical policies that stru change stru structural uh, effects. So we had a, we've had a, Labor Party's had a quote of agenda in the past, which has been spectacularly successful. We've got 49 percent, 48 percent, 9 percent more women in the federal parliament. Can this kind of thing? What, what's your view on this with respect to greater diversity in the parliament? And I know there are internal impediments to migrant, migrant people getting involved in politics. Like my family, like why would you go into new politics? study, be a doctor or a lawyer or a chemist or whatever it is, or an engineer. And I trust that. Yeah, because they're important. coming from countries where they're escaping effectively from politics in some respect. What's your view of that? Well, we need to, um, first of the affirmative action targets that, that you know, I was obviously old when I was uh, young and probably a lot more naive in the 90s and driving the changes in the state rules and then uh, I always saw those targets, frankly, not as quite as in their per se, and they, they are. But the objective was actually to change the culture of the party. Uh, and to make sure that we had a party that stopped uh, looking, not, that failed to look for women uh, in terms of representation. So, yes, those quotas are important to get more women into parliament, but the, the effect of them a much more important uh, outcome, which is the, the change the culture of the party, the culture of the way the power is shared and the uh, power is managed. Uh, and I think we have achieved that. And I think one of the things that is different if you look at the way publishers oh, talk about this and the way the government talks about this, I don't know. How are people talking about 